Um, anyway, it's very nice to see you all, and thank you for, for joining us. Um, Henning, I've taken up too much of your time. Over to you. Thank you very much, Roderick. Um, it's indeed a great pleasure um, to chairing this, this illustrious panel um, on a topic, British-German relations, which um, have been close to my heart for, for over 30 years. Um, we'll uh, uh, have, have a great panel, as, 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 as uh, Roderick already mentioned, um, just, just uh, sort of to explain how, how they connect to me. Or sort of, or, or, so I had the great pleasure of working both with Hans and with Nikolai on various occasions, contributing to um, what used to be called the Berlin Policy Journal and is now International Politik Quarterly, and of course also the German um, edition International Politik on many occasions. And, and Francisca Brandner is very kindly working on an article for International Politik, and we are much looking forward to uh, her pro uh, in part of a pro and contra piece, um, whether it's a wise idea to have Eurobonds or not. So um, um, that's something to look forward to for the next um, issue of IP and also of um, IPQ. Um, we'll uh, start off with, um, with testing the hypothesis which Roderick has, has, uh, has, has given us. Is there actually a way to look beyond Brexit? And, and I would struck a slightly more positive note or optimistic note. I think we can and I, I try to push us a little in, into these areas where possibly Germany and Britain and by extension the EU and Britain could actually work productively together in the future. We will then sort of jump into various sort of policy fields which look promising and um, then uh, I hope I get, get, can get the panel discussing among themselves and, and, and if you've got questions or comments please um, first of all um, put them into the chat and I'll try my level best to, to pick up on them and sort of sort of intersperse them into the discussion. And if we have time at the end, I also would like to, to call a couple of you up uh, for, for a short Q&A. Um, and um, I, I should, should sort of also uh, warn you or advise you that this, uh, this event is, is, is recorded. So if you don't like that, um, then that's the moment to, to check out again. And um, we have to stop uh, uh, or have to, to conclude very, very sort of punctually um, at uh, 3 p.m. And so with, with no further ado, I'd like to, to jump right in to, to the discussion. And um, many have sort of framed Brexit or, or, or the recent events, or which started with a, with, a, with a British referendum in June uh, 2016, um, which seems such a long time ago now, um, as, as a divorce, sort of two, two, two parts split apart, and that's always Never, never a nice, nice thing to do, or, or at least in most occasions. And the question now is, of course, um, 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 can can we get beyond that? Some some sort of initial reactions are a little bit like like in real life, where, where someone says, "I'll never talk to him or her again ever." Um, and uh, some some sort of some might say that that's not wanting to talk to a EU, a EU ambassador or have one in London or or call him that in that way. Uh, sort of constitutes this kind of, I don't know, sort of emotional um, uh, sort of inter interplay, which which we might observe. So the big question now is sort of can we can we look beyond this sort of what or what is necessary to 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 to, um, to approach this bilateral relationship in a new way. And and my first question is this possible? And if so, how goes to Francisca Pan? Mensch, ich muss mich noch entstummen. Um, herzlichen Dank für die Einladung in diese Runde. And I will talk in English, um, so don't worry. Uh, I just wanted to say a thank you in German. Um, you know, I, all the British I speak to, especially those in Scotland, Northern Ireland, the one thing they wish for is normalcy after the last five years of difficult times. And they realize that with the... EU-UK agreement that won't exist for still some time. And I think that the EU-UK agreement is a very unstable one and a highly political one. It has very weak institutions, you know, that the European Court of Justice has not been given any role. When it comes to the difficult issue of level playing field, you only have one level uh, of complaint, you don't have two instances. Um, 
you have very weak wording there, which is very broad. Uh, you have on fisheries a renegotiation looming after a couple of years. You have at every chapter, you have the possibility to exit the agreement. You can exit it very quickly. Um, so for me, the one thing about this EU-UK agreement is that it's unstable and prone to political fights over tiny things. Um, and I think that's what we have seen already in the reality. Um, and we see that the British government is not ready to make its own actors, its companies, etc., really fit for dealing with the situation, for example, um, in Northern Ireland, etc. It's still not clear who is financing the people who do control, what exactly do they control. Um, so I, I think, you know, it's, it's really a shame that this has not, not been prepared. Um, and that we have, therefore, the difficulties on the ground, uh, which take and do consume our attention because it's people's everyday lives. And, you know, talking about big strategy, the Pacific, etc. cetera, uh, it's hard to do when people don't know if they can export their salmon. Um, and that's what they do worry about, uh, and, and rightly so. Uh, so I, th I think, you know, this agreement was in a way built from the British side as well, because they refused any strong institutional setting so that they could um, have this politicized fighting with the EU forever, or at least as long as Johnson is pleased by it and it helps him. Um, and of course, you have mentioned it uh, yourself, they refuse any official interaction with the EU uh, to have the um, representation of the EU there as an ambassador, etc. And all, over all of the negotiations, they refuse to talk about the future foreign uh, and security policy cooperation. So, you know, I think uh, we have to tackle together the COVID crisis. Um, and we see that it's difficult. Uh, the EU made a mistake when it came, you know, to Northern Ireland and the border question. But I also find it's important to mention how many million doses of vaccine go from the EU to the UK. Um, and that this is really making also the UK uh, success possible. And uh, that it's not about UK production capacity, but about European, which we still have to increase as Europeans. So I don't even want to blame the UK, but I think, you know, we as Europeans have to together get better at producing more vaccination doses instead of fighting over them. Uh, but I think, you know, the tone in town is not set for working together to get more production capacity, but to fight over the existing one. Um, so there, I think, you know, we really uh, should work together to enhance the production capacity. When it comes to climate and environmental law, I find it interesting that, for example, Scotland has uh, decided to keep up EU environmental legislation, uh, that the first attempt was blocked by London. Uh, then they did it in a different ways because they want to keep up the high level of environmental protection that the EU has so far and want to um, keep it also on climate protection. So that will be an interesting internal UK uh, setting to see if the rest of the UK as it has started to lower its environmental standards and Scotland keeps uh, it up its high standards and, and how that will impact the British debate. So I think, you know, yes, there are also partners in the UK that we should work with. Um, Glasgow is coming up. We know that regions have a very important role to play there. The under two coalition of regions, California, my state of Baden-Württemberg, Scotland, and, you know, Scotland is a co-chair of that. Um, so I think there are many opportunities where we can cooperate and where we should strengthen uh, cooperation. And then talking about foreign affairs, you know, I think it would be wrong by EU member states to say, okay, the UK refuses to admit that there is such a thing as the European institutions. Um, and I think it would be wrong if each member state now goes for a bilateral relation with the UK, uh, but that the member states do coordinate a joint approach on how they want to interact with the UK on international foreign affairs. I think it, you know, it would be wrong to do it just bilaterally. It should be in a joint approach by the 27.
so far from my side. I wish the agreement was more stable. Um, I wish it would be less politicized. I wish we could be in a different place, but probably for some time we're still in a difficult one. And I think we have to be clear that rules must be kept from the beginning because they won't be, it will be difficult to insist on rules to be kept afterwards. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, we have to fix it first and then, then we can, can, can go beyond that. That seems to be uh, it in a nutshell. Um, Hans, over to you. Is this also your, your view or are there sort of other ways looking beyond the present crisis? Yeah, I think I look at this a little bit differently. Let me start by saying I, I really liked Roderick's um, Freudian framing of this question, the narcissism of small differences, and it sort of immediately made me think of a, of a piece that I wrote, um, sort of when the issue of Brexit was starting to loom, sort of probably around 2014 or something like that, and it was called British and German Pathologies. Um, and the argument was essentially that, you know, since the beginning of the Euro crisis, Britain and Germany both seemed to be reverting to their historical pathologies in relation to Europe. Um, a British pathology of disengagement um, and uh, a German pathology of dominance uh, in Europe. Um, and that's sort of a way of saying that, you know, if we do want to put this in Freudian terms, that I think the pathologies go deeper than the, the, the phrasing of the idea of the sort of narcissism of small differences kind of suggests. I think there are some deeper problems here. Um, so I'll, I'll basically say two things about how I think we should think about the bilateral relationship between uh, Britain and Germany, and in particular how it was, it's sort of quite complicated. Um, so the first is, and, and you know, this has been implicit in everything that Francisca has said, um, it's quite difficult to talk about the bilateral relationship between Britain and Germany without talking about the EU, right? I mean, almost nothing that Francisca said was about the bilateral relationship, it was entirely about the relationship between Britain and the EU. So, and that's kind of obvious. Um, um, and I think also, you know, apart from the, the debates around, you know, the, uh, around the, the agreement and so on, I think also, you know, everything that's been happening in the last few weeks around vaccines kind of also illustrates this same issue that, you know, it's, it's almost impossible to talk about the bilateral relationship without talking about the EU and this kind of complicated way in which Germany sort of refracts its interests through the EU, also instrumentalizes the EU. You know, I think you said at the beginning, um, Henning, you know, Germany and by extension the EU, right? You know, sort of beneath or within that phrase is a lot of complexity about Germany's, you know, I would say semi-hegemonic position within the EU, right? But we sort of need to sort of unpack that a little bit. But, but more in a way, more importantly than that, I think when you talk about France, because you know, specifically about France, because it seems to me that there's always been this kind of triangle of Britain, France, and Germany, which again is kind of complex and intriguing in all kinds of in all kinds of ways. And just one illustration of that is the way that you know the French position about British membership of the EEC, you know, the, the, the sort of shift away from saying you know no to British membership of the EEC to accepting acceptance of it. I would argue, has a lot to do with the way that the distribution of power between France and West Germany was changing in West Germany's favour at that time. Um, and so, in a sense, France wanted the UK in the EEC to help balance against Germany, right? So there are constantly, I think, all of these bilateral relationships within that triangle kind of always have the third member of the triangle in mind, and there are all these kind of balancing games going on. Um, and so I think just a lot will depend on how the EU evolves and, and in particular how the, the relationship between France and Germany evolves. Um, uh, and, you know, obviously what's happened, you know, since uh, that moment, as I, as I say, when, when France reconciled itself to, to Britain joining, uh, became more positive about Britain joining the EEC, and especially since reunification, is that power has shifted even further towards Germany with all kinds of consequences. I would argue it's one of the main reasons why the EU has now become dysfunctional. Um, but I think in any case, whether, whether you, know, you agree with that or not, I think a lot depends on how the EU evolves and in particular the roles of France and Germany uh, within it and the sort of battle that is going on between French and German ideas, interests and, and, and so on to shape the future of, of the EU. So I think it, you know, basically that's a long way of saying it's quite difficult to talk about the bilateral relationship without talking about the EU and in particular about France. 
And then the second thing that I think is really important is I, I want to sort of bring politics into this, um, by which I mean sort of basically left-right politics. Um, uh, because, um, because I think, um, you know, there has, there has, I think we need to think about politically, if there is going to be some kind of bilateral kind of um, relationship between Britain and Germany, what are the politics behind that? Um, there's long, I think, been a kind of right-wing uh, sort of British-German uh, kind of meeting of minds or sort of an alignment. Um, and I think what often happens in these bilateral kind of gatherings of Brits and Germans is that it's that type of agenda, essentially an economic liberal agenda, sort of against France, actually, right? Um, it's sort of an anti-French kind of agenda around economic liberalization based on a sort of fear about French protectionism and other things. Um, in theory, there could be a left-wing kind of alignment between Britain and Germany, but actually in the context of, you know, what, during the last 10 years or so, uh, through the sort of Euro crisis and then through Brexit, it seems to me that the British and German left have been completely talking past each other. Um, so that's been completely absent, the idea that there might be some sort of British-German kind of left-wing kind of alignment. And then what I think is happening is finally brings me to, to, to Britain, what's happening in Britain post-Brexit. Um, and, and this is where I'll end is, I think there's something really interesting going on on the British right. Um, but I think it means that it's even less likely than in the past that you have a, that kind of right-wing British-German kind of cooperation. Um, and that's essentially, I think, to do with the way that the relationship of the British right with economic liberalism is now changing in a quite interesting way. Um, when David Cameron in 2011 uh, tried to block the fiscal compact, which in a sense set in, set in motion the sort of chain of events that led to the Brexit referendum, he was doing so on behalf of the city, very traditional sort of conservative kind of approach. But what's so fascinating is that through that chain of events, What's happened is that the Conservative Party has itself been changed. In particular, the fact that you now have all of these Conservative MPs representing seats in the north of England, you know, what used to be the Red Wall, the Labour Red Wall. These are now Conservative seats. And so what you see as a consequence of that is the Conservative Party having to sort of rethink its approach to economic policy and having to reconcile on the one hand the interests of the city with the interests of people who have very, very different interests. Um, and I think that's taking us towards a, uh, a sort of very different uh, sort of conservative approach to economic policy. And that I think means in turn that the common ground between the British right and, and the German right, I think is there's much less common ground than, than there was before. So this is all a very long way of saying, you know, I don't quite see where some kind of British German alignment is going to come from in political terms. Thank you very much, Hans. So certainly a long way, sort of, or thinking back to the Schröder uh, uh, um, Blair paper, sort of, and you could, could argue whether that's, that's a left or, or right, right wing project. Uh, anyway, it didn't, didn't, didn't happen in the end. So um, interesting. Um, Nikolai, I would invite you to, to come, come, come in on this as well. Do, do you see any chance of sort of somehow sort of um, Entering the sunlit uplands, I think uh, the prime minister would have would have called it um, of of a sort of of a relationship which sort of leaves sort of somehow since the Brexit uh, um, uh, uh, Brexit punch up um, behind us. Um, I'm afraid to say I, th I personally have become more pessimistic over the course of this year on on how the relationship can develop, um, and it's maybe due to, to two major things where I want to add up on on what Hans and Franziska have been saying. Uh, the first is the intertwinement of the uh, German UK German uh, EU UK relationship, and I would take a little bit of a different perspective from Hans. I think part of the reason is that. Uh, over the course of the whole of the Brexit negotiations, Germany basically had the goal of strengthening the EU 27, keeping the single market together, showing solidarity towards Ireland. And this was of a lesser importance 
than having a good trade relationship with the United Kingdom. So the priority was keeping the European Union together. So any friction in the EU-UK relationship also immediately entered the German-UK relationship, with Germany becoming much more hesitant to take up some of the offers from the United Kingdom for closer bilateral ties that have been going on over the last couple of years. And therefore, I think the actions of the UK government with a very aggressive negotiation stance in, in the last year in the Brexit negotiations have directly feed in, into the German-UK relationship. And I would uh, name, name two instances in particular. The first was the internal market bill. Um, so the first signaling by the UK that was willing to break the commitments in the Northern Ireland Protocol. And I feel always German perceive uh, international and European politics very strongly through the prism of law. Um, and Francisca very much stressed the point, rules need to be kept. Um, and uh, you need to implement what you signed up to. Pacta sunt servanda. And I think that's a very German view, if I'm, uh, if I'm maybe uh, able to say so, on European politics. And therefore, the idea that you would willingly violate a treaty that you signed just eight months ago and then say to your parliament, OK, I'm willing to do that, uh, was, I think, for German for German um, uh, observers very outrageous and showed that there was a deep, deep hurt on trust in the UK government uh, in, in the Brexit negotiations. And then when we finally had the, had the trade and cooperation agreement, just one month or I think now two months afterwards, the UK government signaled again uh, that it was willing to unilaterally extend part of the, uh, part of the grace periods in the Northern Ireland Protocol. So again, signaling its willingness to step over the commitments it's signed. And that is a very, uh, very strong signal, I think, from a German point of view of the UK government being unreliable uh, and not being able to trust what it signed up to, and therefore uh, opening a, a lot of question mark how the other part of the of the treaty can be kept uh, with, with the UK government. And this is maybe the part where I would uh, disagree to some extent with Francisca. For me, the problem uh, is not with the institutions, um, of the trade agreement. They are not that dissimilar to other trade agreements um, outside of single market association uh, like uh, the, uh, the European Economic Area or like the bilateral treaties with Switzerland. They are more like a traditional, as the UK wanted, more like a traditional trade, a trade agreement. And there you have institutions uh, that are as, as robust as, as normal EU trade agreement uh, institutions are. The problems here for me are much more with the politics. Um, and they have to do with um, and here I, I come back to Roderick's title, with both sides, I am afraid needing to show uh, that, they are, um, that the other side has made the inferior choice. Uh, for the United Kingdom, it's very clear that UK politics wants to show that, uh, there, that there are benefits of Brexit um, and that any problems that arise of Brexit are due to the inflexibility of the European Union. So you can already see in these last two to three, two to three months, a very clear pattern by the UK government to celebrate any success of what the UK has done on its own, like in the vaccination campaign, and then blame any troubles uh, in the trade relationship in Northern Ireland um, or even in foreign affairs on the inflexible European Union that's not willing uh, to work uh, um, as pragmatic as the United Kingdom wants it to. And so that means from the from side of UK politics, it constantly means to show uh, that the EU is a source of problems uh, and Brexit is a source of success. Um, and I think this makes dealing with the UK uh, for the European Union quite, uh, quite uh, problematic. But I have to say also on the other side, uh, from a European EU point of view, uh, the UK is now outside of Russia, the only European country that is not in some shape or form connected to the EU single market. So it is clearly a geo-economic competitor to the European Union. Um, it is a different model to the European Union. And huge successes of the UK after Brexit will be interpreted in the, within the EU as weakness of the e European model. Uh, and you can see that as well in the vaccination campaign where European newspapers are now also full of comparison of the vaccination rate in the United Kingdom vis-a-vis -vis the EU. Uh, there are clearly questions being asked, why can't they, can they do it much faster than we can do it? And we will see that with every 
uh, with every way uh, where the UK differs from EU politics, there will be special intention whether the UK model is more successful where the, uh, as a European model. And therefore you have two sides basically who have very close interests to each other. Uh, the values are still very much overlapping. And I would say in 90% of our international interests, there's still a huge overlap between the EU uh, Germany and the United Kingdom. Uh, but at the same time, you have the two sides guarding each other very, very carefully, always uh, looking, what does the other better than me? Um, how do I compare to the EU? How do I compare to the uh, United Kingdom? And that makes a positive relationship uh, very difficult. And this is why I would say the institutions are actually in place. Uh, the trade and cooperation agreement actually allows also for additional parts of cooperation to be added upon the institutional structure of the agreement, but the politics of both sides make it very, very difficult to come into a constructive partnership where you work together constructively, even on these areas where you have joint interests. Thank you very much, Nikolai. Um, the, the question, of course, is whether, whether the EU or, or even the Germans should always sort of jump, jump uh, when, 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 <laughs> when this kind of, of comparison is made. I mean, if, if, when Bill says, uh, Wir beneiden euch, dear Brits, um, maybe another headline would also be, be possible. I'm just suggesting or thank you, thinking, thinking aloud. And another other area, of course, would be climate um, protection, which I, I wanted to discuss with, with Francisca Brandner in particular. Um, the EU is still on, on track or, or sort of has, has said uh, our aim is, is a reduction of 55% uh, from 1990 levels uh, in terms of cutting CO2 emissions. Um, um, the British have, have gone on better, saying they, they want to reach uh, 68%. Um, very ambitious and uh, sort of is this nonetheless a sort of uh, a desirable race to the bottom, one could say? Uh, we, we all be the benefit, uh, or we all will benefit if, 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 if the Brit Britain reaches its goals earlier than the EU. What do you think? Yeah, I think, you know, when it comes to climate protection, we will have to work together. Um, by the way, not just with the UK, but internationally with the US now with Biden. Um, and I think we will will face similar problems when it comes to trade internationally. Um, and we have been advocating for creating sort of a transatlantic uh, climate area with the UK, with the US, uh, because we will have this, these discussions of if we do reduce the CO2 in our steel and our cement, um, and then we will import it in a dirty way from other countries in the world. We haven't done anything for the climate, nor for our industries. So the question is, can we make a joint approach to that without having to become protectionist? Um, and there we as Greens always see it as a transatlantic way, including the UK in it. Um, and by the way, when I talked about the under two coalition earlier, that's not EU based, that's really of uh, regions working together. And I, I find it, really wonderful to see how my state Baden Württemberg is cooperating with Scotland on climate protection. Um, and this is independent from an EU level. They're doing it from region to region. Uh, and I think if we do talk about the future of German UK relations, uh, it's fair enough to speak about our regions as well. Um, and I think that this is something that we should not forget because uh, we have seen that how important it was in the US when Trump was in administration that we did have that regional cooperation with California, other regions, uh, and that it helped us to get through a difficult time when it was not so easy to negotiate with the leadership. And I think we have to a certain extent also with Johnson, a difficult partner, and then to say, but we wanna sustain context is exchange joint programs. And we do do that as well as a regional level is a positive step. Um, and allow me to say, you know, Hans, you said that the UK German uh, relations are right, like in a political spectrum, right? I don't know where you go. Um, I have very intense, uh, you know, very progressive exchanges uh, with the, you know, Royal Academy. You know, there are many actors and fora of exchange where I draw a lot of um, intellectual stimulation and where we have great debates. And they're very progressive um, between UK's actors, maybe not in these four, DGAP or I don't know, or, you know, uh, but I have very rich, intense, uh, progressive networks and we have a lot of discussions going on there. Um, 
how you manage diversity in a democratic way without excluding others, how you manage uh, climate protection uh, and be socially just. Uh, we have, you know, it's a very stimulating and, and I appreciate that exchange a lot. Uh, and it's not just with my green partners, but really much more broad on a progressive scale. Um, so I was a bit surprised when you said it's right. I think there are some fora which are dominated by this, but I think it would be really wrong uh, to conclude from that that this is the entire EU, uh, Germany, UK relationship. Um, and I think that, you know, sometimes that uh, gets maybe lost because it's not uh, in the Bildzeitung, um, but it's still very much there. And when I come to the um, you know, the German place in the EU without the UK, yes, it, it's interesting for the German government no longer to have the UK uh, as the, the forefighter against many things the German government didn't like in the past. And I, I was thinking the other day when the European Commission now put a proposal for um, equal pay in Europe, I was so sure, unlike the German government has been fighting this for years, the current and the last one, and the British government was vehemently always opposed to an equal pay uh, directive, uh, but the German government was able to hide between the British for many years. And I just thought about how it will turn out when the Germans no longer, no longer have the Brits to hide behind, um, how they're gonna sell to the German audiences that they actually really want women to be paid less uh, than men because it's a hard sell also in the German audience and it was so comfortable that we could hide or we the German government could hide be behind the British um, but it might change what kind of German positions we have uh, in the future and one last point about the agreement because Nicolai you said it's sort of like a trade agreement yes it is like a trade agreement with Vietnam but the problem is that our relations are so much closer <laughs> um, and that's why it's so difficult to have like an agreement a trade agreement like with Vietnam with a partner with a country that is so close and so integrated and this is exactly the problem um, uh, and you know you said it's maybe the institutions are like with the trade agreement with Vietnam, yes, but you also have on the substance, you know, when it comes to the balancing mechanism, you have substantial divergence and a material impact, both are not defined uh, and are open to such large interpretations. It's clear there will be fights over it. As soon as somebody wants to be in a, in a destructive way, you can use it at any corner. Like if you are both in a constructive mood, it can work perfectly that treaty. But if one of them is in a destructive mode, it will be highly political and, and painful for years to come. And, and so I think the, you know, the German relation really uh, will be one not to have a bilateral relationship over the head of all the other European member states. I really think so. I think it would be wrong for within the EU that Germany just says, oh, I don't care about France, Belgium, Poland, all the other countries. I just do my bilateral relationship with the UK. I think it would create terrible dynamics within the EU. Um, and that's why I think we really uh, should keep a European approach. Thank you very much, Hans. So many things to pick up on. Um, can sort of can be when, when Britain comes with bilateralism, can be sort of counter with regionalism, <laughs> or or sort of um, or this this topic which Francisca Brandes has sort of mentioned, hiding behind the British. There was a sort of a, a wide sort of shoulder uh, where 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 Berlin could could sort of could sort of hide behind. It's it's gone, and and um, is that maybe also a, a a positive thing for if we look at 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 how how the EU. Is going to develop. You made the point that it's it's crucial actually, sort of how the how the EU will, will, will move forward in, in terms of, of determining the relationship. And uh, since uh, Francisca Brandner mentioned um, Vietnam, and and it's also something I wanted to 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 to, to push you um, to 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 maybe maybe say say a word or two uh, about um, in the Pacific. It's a new new thing. If, if, if it's sort of both for the for for Germany for France. Um, and also for the UK, um, reading the integrated review um, of last week, um, is that not where 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 stars should align? Uh, I mean, both the UK and the EU have have or, or individual players within the EU have have real sort of the the the, the, the power to 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 be much of an actor in in, in the Indo Pacific or in in the area we now call Indo Pacific. Um, um, is that not not a, not a sort of natural 
natural playground for, for these two sides to get together again. Yeah. So, yes, in terms of um, the sort of dynamics within the EU and how Brexit has changed that, I mean, I have to say, I, from my perspective, I think Brexit has made the EU more dysfunctional um, for exactly this reason, that I think there was a certain kind of, you know, the way I think of the EU is that it functions when there's certain kinds of balances going on. And in particular, obviously, the balance between France and Germany is at the heart of this. And I think that balance has essentially gone since German reunification, which is a large part of why the, the EU no longer functions properly. But as I was indicating earlier, there's also a sort of balance in terms of the triangle between Britain, France and Germany. That I think also is part of how the, 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 the EU worked in a, at a time when, you know, from a time onwards, when the balance between France and West Germany no longer functioned. And so you needed to bring in Britain to restore a kind of a balance. Um, and so I think what's now happened in the EU is precisely with the withdrawal of the EU, um, it's made it even more dysfunctional. And I think one example of that um, is, you know, I mean, in, in the sort of four years since the referendum happened, it isn't as if the EU has made massive breakthroughs in, in any uh, particular kind of way that a lot of people were hoping for and expecting. Rather, it seems to me, as I say, it's been, it's been rather dysfunctional. One of, the, one of the things that has emerged, I think, as a consequence of Brexit, which illustrates this, is the new Hanseatic League of sort of northern EU economic liberal member states, right? And that was specifically a response to the way that as a consequence of Britain withdrawing, there was this sense that now the balance might shift towards sort of French protectionism, and Germany might be sort of weakened in that respect. And so we have to shore up the sort of economic liberal kind of coalition within the EU. Um, and and, and as, from my point of view, that, that has made the, the EU even more dysfunctional than, than it was before, particularly in terms of thinking about how you find a, a solution to essentially the economic problems around the euro that now you know have, you know haven't haven't been solved for 10 years and i think ultimately is is what the future of the the eu depends on so i have to say i'm i'm rather pessimistic about uh, all of that um then on the indo-pacific and in a way this kind of slightly follows on you know i have to say i just don't see britain and germany having particular shared interests there um, on the contrary, I think Britain and France might have some shared interests in the Indo-Pacific, which is partly to do with the way that they have similar strategic cultures, they have a similar, not, not the same, but somewhat similar uh, history in the Indo-Pacific. France obviously has 1.5 million citizens in the Indo-Pacific. Britain has some other historic links in the Indo-Pacific. they were also both nuclear powers permanent members of the, Europe, of the UN Security Council, which means that they lean into the Indo-Pacific in a completely different way than Germany. Um, and on top of that, I think the economic relationship between China and Germany, which I've written quite a lot about, I think is it just positions Germany completely differently in the Indo-Pacific, I think in a very, very problematic way. And so if anything, it seems to me um, that, you know, there's more alignment between France and, Germ France and the UK on the Indo-Pacific um, and Germany is, is, a, is in a completely different space. Um, and then um, finally, just on this point, just I should clarify in, in response to Francisca, what I was trying to say about the sort of left uh, uh, kind of conversation between Britain and Germany. Um, I was thinking, you know, the, when I was thinking of the right wing version of this, I, I was thinking of things like Königswinter, which to me do sort of very much embody that, that sort of economic liberal kind of alignment. Um, in terms of the left, um, I was thinking in particular of conversations that I've been in between the Labour Party and the SPD. Um, and as I say, we've been talking past each other for the last, um, for the last uh, decade, which I think has, you know, a lot of that is to do with the way that the SPD has moved so far to the right on economic policy in the context of the Grand Coalition, um, that it's very difficult now for, for, for people on the, um, on the left in Britain uh, to have a conversation uh, with, with the SPD about some of these questions. But also, I think this also goes for the Greens, Francisca, as well, because I, th I think what would happen, I, I think basically the, the, the situation here is that we just don't agree in Britain and Germany on what it even means to be on the left, what it means to be progressive. So I think if you and I were to have a longer conversation about this, which I hope we can do at some point, I think what would happen would be that I would say to you, I, what, what you know, your politics don't sound to me to be that left wing, particularly on economic policy. And you would say to me, I think you sound like a populist. 
well, that, that certainly needs to happen at some point. Uh, now, I would love to, to moderate this, this, this exchange. But um, let's move to, um, move to Nikolai. Um, uh, so this, Hans already said um, there's, there's uh, in security terms, um, the UK and, and, and Germany are on different, different levels altogether. Um, but then again, if you look back into history, the, the sort of so-called silent alliance between um, Britain and, and and, and Germany at some point was, was sort of hailed as this kind of this, this Delphi, not much talked about uh, cooperation between two countries which sort of helped to stabilize the European continent. Um, maybe that was a bit of wishful thinking, but couldn't you make this the case that, that with, with the geopolitics um, being what they are, sort of Britain uh, as, as threatened as, as the rest of Europe by, by, by Russian aggression, for instance, wouldn't there sort of um, wouldn't it make the case sort of to 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 jump out or to, to leave behind some of the EU structures, and and try try new forms of, of security cooperation, maybe within NATO, but but uh, or, or another sort of um, initiatives like PESCO, which is open to non-EU members. Um, is this something worth exploring in your view? And um, maybe one final jump to to the bilateral question. We, this, this sort of this post-war relationship has grown through, over many years and has a sort of Königs Winter as a sort of core, um, core uh, sort of um, a piece of, of sort of inter interchange um, or exchange on a bilateral level. Is, is this, is this for, will that go on or, or do we need to think about new ways of, 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 of talking to each other when, when we already see that Hans and Franziska have, will probably have sort of very many, many sort of points of disagreement when, when they, they want to talk about very basic things, so. So a lot of ground, uh, a lot of ground to cover, maybe start with, with foreign and security policy. Um, I would say this has been an aspect where I would say it has been quite successfully shielded from Brexit until the end of last year. Um, so I would say since 2016, uh, there was indeed some worry whether whether the UK would follow a lot of the, uh, let's say, erratic foreign policy under Trump of the United States, uh, whether we would see a sort of uh, a new uh, UK-US alliance breaking away from European partners. Um, and I think from a, from a German perspective, uh, there was quite a relief that on many issues, the UK actually sided with the other Europeans vis-a-vis -vis Trump. So on the the Paris Climate Agreement on Iran, the E3, on the question of the uh, US Embassy in Jerusalem, how to deal with Russia. So a lot of these issues, uh, the UK actually coordinated quite closely, less with an EU framework, more with an E3 framework together with Germany and France. And so there was actually quite some appreciation that here the UK stick with its European partners. And I would say paradoxically, since the election of Biden, there's a temptation in the UK again to put on the one side the Anglosphere and on the other side the EU, Germany and Paris. And we've seen that, for instance, yesterday when we had the sanctions against uh, China on, uh, on human rights ground, that there was on the one side the EU decision and on the other side, a UK, US, Canada decision to sanction people. Uh, and it was basically, it was coordinated silently behind closed doors, but you had separate statements, separate sanctions from the Anglosphere and from the European Union. And this is part of my fear that we're developing now in a situation where also if you look at um, uh, Prime Minister Johnson's speech at the Munich Security Conference, where the UK again presented itself as the closest European ally of the United States, uh, whereas Macron and Merkel were much more hesitant on how to deal with China, much more saying, yes, we have our own interests, which we have interests, which we have to take care on, uh, where I think now it's actually paradoxically after the change from Trump to Biden, more important to keep the UK on board. And the danger is greater to have the split between the Anglosphere um, and, and the European Union. And this brings me to the second part of the question, the, the bilateral relationship. And here I would say there is a real dilemma for Germany because it has a strong interest to keep the UK on board and within the European foreign policy coordination. But we know that the UK has made a very clear choice not to cooperate structure, structurally with the e European Union on foreign and security policy. So there's always the question, should we accommodate the UK 
and do it vis-a-vis -vis the E3 or bilaterally between Berlin and London? Or should we try to focus on the European Union in terms of European uh, autonomy, uh, strategic autonomy, and strengthening the EU as a foreign policy actor? Uh, and this dilemma, I think, hasn't really been resolved in Germany. In Germany. And I would say the outright refusal of the UK to cooperate with the EU on foreign affairs has made this, this harder. And we've seen that, uh, I think it was even in 2018, when uh, then UK Foreign Minister Boris Johnson had a declaration with then German Foreign Minister Heiko Maas about a closer, uh, a closer German-UK cooperation on foreign policy. They uh, said they wanted to have a closer structural coordination, and that has been delayed again and again and again. Um, precisely because the UK has, from a German point of view, poisoned the UK-EU relationship also on foreign and security policy. So I would say there is, there is this dilemma for Germany. It hasn't really worked out how to solve it. Um, and I would argue if the UK is a little bit less ideologically, if I can say for one time, on foreign policy and works a bit with the EU uh, on foreign policy, then I would say Berlin would be very open uh, to a much closer bilateral relationship on foreign policy and possibly other issues. Thank you very much. Um, with, with an eye on the time, I'm, I'm afraid we don't have, have that much left. Um, I try to, to, to put a few sort of questions um, into that. One is sort of, uh, alluding to the latest economist Charlemagne uh, column, um, are the Brits now the new Turks? Sort of, maybe another sort of uncomfortable neighbor uh, sort of at our doorstep. Maybe there's something. But, but Francisco, you wanted to come in on, on the question of of formats, um, whether 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 we are we are where we are there. And it's, uh, I think you made your point already. But, but maybe just to clarify, the the joint declaration on foreign policy between Berlin and London, which um, has been in the making for quite a while, uh, Nikolai mentioned it. Um, is this something which, which, uh, which should be pushed even further down the road? Yeah, many things. Um, I, I think, you know, Hans, what is interesting to see is what the UK government stood for for very long in terms of neoliberal market-based policies is no longer the current government policy. And like, if you look at the current Tory government, they're doing, you know, I would say, who <laughs> don't you want to introduce some elements of market and competition in your policies? Um, you know, that even for me, that sounds, you know, I'm like, who? This is completely state-based. Um, so I, I really wonder how that uh, would change now if the UK was still in the EU, um, if it wasn't maybe rather a French-UK alliance against the Netherlands and the Austrians. Um, so I'm not sure at all if there would be still such a thing as a Hanseatic against the French. Um, I think the change in policies is quite interesting. Um, and I must say that the you know, yes, we have had a Merkel government for 16 years now in Germany, which was closer to a neoliberal approach uh, than, you know, to others. And, um, but this has been also a political, you know, decision. And, and I think we have moved also quite a bit from this in Germany, um, when you look at how much we're spending these days in the crisis, etc. So I think, you know, in a way, we rather see convergence there. Um, and that it's not that stark anymore. Uh, and I would say on what you said, you know, Königs Winter, et cetera, I would sometimes say that the fact that many of these official and traditional fora have not been modernized and updated and not been more inclusive in terms of replicating and representing the societies, we lost a lot of touch between the UK and Germany. Um, and that one of the really challenges we do have to focus is to re-modernize our channels of communication, bring in other voices. Uh, really, if we want to make this a good partnership, we have to bring other people and different people at the table and make the debate much more lively. Um, so in terms of, you know, what would we do? I think we really have to give an update to our civil society, business, etc., university partnerships, ensure that we will not have less research cooperation, etc. Um, and when it comes to, you know, the dilemma that uh, Nikolai just presented, I, you know, we, we wouldn't go for either or, because I think, you know, will Johnson give up on his ideological position that the EU doesn't exist for him in foreign policy? Probably not. Um, so I probably would go for something in between, you know, to say we do cooperate within the EU as 27 and we say U4-5 
you will interact with the UK in this way, but you will always come back to us and don't do it over our head. I'm like, you have to find something in between. Um, and it cannot uh, be that just the Germans do it without coordinating it with the EU member states. That's all that I said, because that would really make some of them fearful uh, and not you know, in a good position. And I think it would help any side. So the question is, how can we cooperate with the UK in a way that doesn't divide the EU? And I would agree that the setup has not yet been defined. All I'm arguing for is to say we have to do it together. Uh, we, you know, we will be able to insist that the EU exists and it does exist, but it won't help us because Johnson won't recognize it. And like as painful as it is, um, and as absurd as, as it is, but you know, I still think we have to find a way to interact on foreign policy. I just wouldn't say it should be just bilateral. I think that would be too harmful. It has to be something in between these two options. Um, and yes, I, you know, that would be my approach to the question by Tobias Wellner written in the chat. And yes, I would invest in many more layered exchanges as well to keep the contact between citizens. So ex exploring the areas in between Hans and Nikolai, is, is, we've got, got a minute each. Um, where are these uh, areas in between before we hand over to Roderick? Hans first, please. I, I'm not sure I had a, have a good answer to that. Um, what I've been thinking about is something that's been running through the conversation, which is um, this question of rules. Um, because I think this is something where there's a, there is this kind of really stark contrast, I think, between the way that we think about, about politics, really, um, which is that, you know, and, and it goes actually, by the way, to what you were saying, Francisco, about neoliberalism, because, you know, there are different ways of thinking about neoliberalism, but one way of thinking about neoliberalism, which comes out, you know, particularly in, in Quinn Slobodian, Slobodian's book, Globalists, is this idea that it's kind of, taking economic policy out of the space of democratic contestation and creating rules to sort of encase economic policy. Um, and, um, you know, that, that in some ways is the essence of neoliberalism. And, and, and to a large extent, that is what the EU does. Um, and, and so there's a way in which it sometimes seems to me that the EU, you know, sometimes thought of as being a sort of compromise between French and German preferences, and in some ways it is, but sometimes it seems to me it's almost like a distilled version of German preferences, because it takes this kind of depoliticization even further than it exists in Germany, right, um, with this insistence on rules. Um, and, and so, you know, I think in the end, a lot of what we're arguing about, whether it's at the global level in terms of the Indo-Pacific and so on, or whether it's in terms of um, the relationship between Britain and the EU, is to what extent we want to replace politics by rules. Um, and what I'm hearing a lot uh, from the EU side is the only way we can do things is to depoliticize things and replace politics by rules. But this, and, and this that's, that's, that's precisely- this There is not here politics and their rules. I'm like, that's wrong. That, that, yeah, that I think that we, have to, we have to have another meeting. It's, it's, it's just impossible. We have so many things we haven't addressed. So. I mean, but, uh, but this exchange illustrates precisely that, that difference in the way we think about this, right? Because I think to a large extent, that is what Britain has basically rejected by leaving the European Union, is the idea that politics should be replaced by rules. Okay, thank you very much. Nikolai, 60 seconds, maybe less. If I, than if I can use my 60 seconds, first point, politics also requires trust. And the UK continuously breaking the commitments it did to the European Union is a huge break on trust. And I think that's also harmful to a good political relationship. And this is my second point. I think what we need to find is a positive agenda. I think we need to find points where the partnership makes a positive contribution. And we've talked fairly little about climate change, but I think COP26 is a real um, is a real possibility there. It is a huge agenda for the United Kingdom. It has always been a big point for the European Union and one where a little bit competition between the two sides could actually benefit both. And so I think we should pick out these areas where we can have a positive relationship that is not necessarily as destructive as we've had so far on vaccines or Northern Ireland between the EU uh, and the UK. And we need to find that both on the bilateral German UK, but also on the EU uh, UK relationship level. Thank you very much. We started with Freud and we ended up uh, playing just a minute. Um, <laughs> so Roderick, over to you um, for a couple of final words. 
Thank you. I, I, I do have some final words, but actually, I'd, I'm, I'm going to give my, my last 30 seconds to Francisco, who's, who's wriggling around trying trying to get a word in. Do, uh, you're right, are you? Okay. Um, look, I mean, from, from my side, um, thank you all very much. I, I've, I've sat in a lot of sort of EU panels where, where everybody says, I, I absolutely agree, and then seem to be saying something completely different. Um, and, and we've just sat in a panel where, where everybody has said, I'm going to disagree. But actually, I've, I've heard a lot of commonality, even if, if Hans, you're, a, you're, you're an inveterate contrarian. Um, I, I, I won't pull them out, but, but I've, I've made a list of, of things where I think, A, we've cleared the air a bit. Um, and B, I think where we've, we've noticed um, sort of scope to, to work a little bit closer together. So I, you know, you, you, may, have, you may have pretended to, to, to disagree with each other vociferously, but I think we've found some common ground. So I take that as a positive. So thank you all. Um, please join me in thanking our, our wonderful panel for, for, for this afternoon. Um, we hope to to have, have to continue this discussion, which, which I found fascinating, and I hope you too. And um, uh, have a good afternoon, and see you soon again at the German Council on Foreign Relations. Thank you very much.